Um, excellent. So, hello, recording. This is Walter uh, speaking. Uh, we are going to uh, start with the lecture. Um, I hope you see the screen. This is, I think, the most mentioned question ever since COVID began. Um, and you can see the second slide now, if you just bear with me for a minute. Uh, sorry about that. Struggling with the screens here. So, okay, yep. good. That's, that's great. So, so we're going to uh, to talk um, about um, food systems uh, with a base in ecological intensification and in value, uh, sustainable value chains. Um, and, and these are many different components together. And I'll, I've developed a little program for this morning for you with five minutes of warming up, getting to know each other a little better, I, I hope. Um, then introducing the aim of the session and uh, the role of this lecture as part of, in fact, a series of three lectures. Uh, that um, uh, we will uh, use to present uh, sustainable agricultural systems to you. And the second lecture is uh, uh, Mariana Scalato from Uruguay. She's also attending. Uh, and the third lecture will be by Professor Santiago Dogliotti from, from Uruguay. And I'm going to tell you how that all fits together. Uh, then I'm going to introduce the Horteco project that Carlos just uh, mentioned. Uh, we'll have a little break, uh, and then I look forward very much to uh, a presentation by one of you, who is going to take over and, and present a paper of uh, Daniel Gaitan Kremarski, um, the, who worked as postdoc with us in Horteco. Um, then we'll have a, a, a little uh, set of activities around that and, and a plenary discussion. And then I'll end with uh, some more uh, details on the results of our DECO project to the extent that that is needed after the presentation of, of the paper. Now, is that okay? Um, can we move to... Um, to the next phase. Yeah, no questions, points. I, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So if you want to use the chat or raise your hand or anything, um, I'll have a look at the chat, but probably Carlos is, is also... Um... Okay. Yes, of course. Yeah? Yeah. Right, uh, then let's, uh, let's start um with the warming up and how did i see that mm, something is not quite right i'm sorry so better and the uh, warm for the warming up i've been thinking to for you to go to uh, this uh, page and that page is a Jamboard page. And my question to you is, where are you from? So maybe also introducing yourself to each other. Um, if you go to this uh, page, you can uh, start to, um, to take the, uh, the post-its. If you double click the you can edit it, you can put your name where it now says my name, you can add new photos from the left side. You have to go to the, to the chat, in the chat is the link to go. The to link the is in the chat, yes. Page. Yeah. Yeah. So just copy, paste it into your browser. 
And you can go here. A number of people already managed. Nine, 10, yeah, great. So let us know where you're from. And you see, I can drag that around. And at the top, there is a pen and you can put the link between your name and uh, the region uh, you're from. Can you try and do that? If you don't succeed, this is also an opportunity. Yes, I'm trying. Yep, yeah, yeah, good. Avantina. So, Carlos, maybe question two. To, to which extent? Uh, the, the system uh, is asking me uh, uh, that you need to accept my. Ah, uh, oh, no. Uh, I, come on. Yeah, the, maybe the, the link. Ah, yeah, but it's okay. Anyone who has the link is it okay? uh, can use it. So that's no yeah. problem, I think. Mm, yeah, let me check okay, again. Huh? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> can you edit? Uh, I'm trying to add, for example, my name, but uh, it doesn't work. But let me check. Some of you it doesn't work. on the way to, to put the, your name. Hmm? The slide. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I, I need to uh, change. Everyone is on the slide, but no one can yeah. uh, write. But, but, you, his name but you, you should be able to do that. Yeah, just to be sure, I'll, I'll enter the link again. Yeah. And now you should be. Are you okay now? I will, I will enter again to the link to check. Yeah, maybe, or uh, use F5 to refresh the page. Yeah, probably, yeah. And then you should be okay. Uh, now, now it's working. Good, excellent. Yeah, I see. And then the, the pen at the very top, you can just choose one of those pens and, and make a little line through your region. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Emiliano, I see. Carlos, you're there. Andrea, Pascal. Martin. Martin. Hector. Excellent. Let's see if we have people from outside the metropolitan area. <laughs> this is where you live now, of course, uh, I imagine, but uh, maybe also where you are from, where, where you grew up. In my line, so I'll remove it. Okay. Elisha, that, that's... Uh... I am from Cartagena, a region of Valparaiso. <laughs> we, we don't hear you very well, Adrian. This, uh, your microphone is not... Cartagena, a uh... region of... Valparaiso. Of oh, Valparaiso. Um, central class, yes. Okay. Mediterranean, yes. Ooh, now it's getting small. Somebody changed uh, the size of the, of the map. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now you're all from the same place. <laughs> But, but so there are people not, not uh, from the fifth region only, right? There are people from yeah. Maule. I... Yeah, from then, several, now it becomes several regions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But pretty much in the orange, uh, in the orange yeah. regions, in the central valley. Yes. Or did we, did we miss anyone not coming from the central valley? Mediterranean regions. Concepcion. No, you're all from there. 
Pues un ¿Mm? Concepción, Valdivia. Concepción. ¿Mm? The last class, we have a student from Australia, de la Universidad Austral, ¿no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. that is located in Valdivia. Right. Okay. So let's uh, let's go to the uh, to the next page then. Uh, we're talking about agriculture and we're talking about food. Where do you get your food? And then I added uh, five possibilities, but maybe you have another option. A farmer from farmers from supermarkets, street markets, local shops, and again you you can move around the the post-its mm -hmm. and. To add to the complexity, this is uh, very much also a test. Uh, you can allocate 10 stars. So you, I don't buy it all uh, in street markets. I also buy in supermarkets and uh, a little bit uh, directly at the farmer store. We have a, um, we have a, a, an arrangement with a farmer here close to Wageningen. Uh, that farm is run by, in fact, five farmers, and they're making cheese, and they're making uh, uh, bread, uh, but they're also vegetables. So we are part of the community of consumers that, that uh, goes to that farm. In fact, the farmer has several locations around Wageningen uh, with uh, a cool storage, and we have a key, and we can go in and uh, open the door, use an app, Tell the farmer what we have uh, taken with us uh, and then at the end of the month we get a bill uh, we pay uh, the money mm -hmm. so uh, that's very much a system based on trust mm -hmm. you can put your name in front of the um, horizontally uh, yeah. around the, the the place where you buy your food for example yeah, in my so case could... I, I i i buy mostly a food from a street market, for example. So I put my name horizontally uh, to a street market, for example. Right. And, and if you feel you, you need to, to allocate your name to several, uh, then put several post-its. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and that's the idea of the 10 stars. So you could tell us how much relatively you take from which uh, source. Mm -hmm. So obviously, well, obviously, but the trend is towards more supermarkets. Uh, although, in fact, in the in terms of vegetables and fruits in Chile, supermarkets only have twenty percent. So that that is surprising, isn't it? So street markets. In, in your case, I see many people going to street markets. That may be uh, uh, an, um, relatively, for instance, to what I'm used to here, uh, that may be an important source of, of food for you, as well as local shops. Mm -hmm. Direct links to farmers, well, uh, not so much. So apparently that goes uh, through street markets or through local shops. And some of you even grow it yourself, 50%, Claudia. That's, that, is, uh, that is substantial. Yeah, congratulations for that. Thank Two you. Rows. Actually, in the summertime, most of my food comes from my garden. But in the wintertime, most of it comes from the supermarkets. Right, OK, yeah. Uh, so we have uh, an own garden. Uh, in, in, a, in a place, uh, such an allot allotment garden. And uh, uh, some of our neighbors are trying to be self-supporting in terms of vegetables from their garden, but they always talk about the hunger gap uh, in the winter time when there is uh, not enough. So yeah, I can understand how that would work. But maybe you're also uh, dictated by, by water availability. How does that work for you? Can I continue your opinion there, Claudia? Yeah, we have it. No, we don't have any problem with water because we have, um, well, we have a, how do you say, well? No, it's not a well. well deep, yeah. deep well, okay. yeah. So it's not an issue. And we have also a superficial well. And also we have this 
water from the water channel. I don't know if that's the name water right. channel. <laughs> okay. So yeah. that's not a problem. It's just the climate that winter time we just have switcher and a few yeah. other greens and that's it. Okay. And Amantina also a farmer. Yeah, so the supermarkets, eh? But the street markets, I'm 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 really surprised. Usually you you see supermarkets with, with our students, supermarkets stand out, and then a little bit of uh, things on the on the left, let's say, but you have a much more equal distribution, um, which would be uh, to be expected uh, given given the distribution of, of the channels that, that we found also in our uh, food system study, Daniel uh, Gaitan found. Good, so now I have a little bit of an idea um, where you buy and then the last question and then we know everything there is to know about each other. Do you check where your food is produced? So is there communication around food? When you go to a street market, do you talk to uh, the person uh, not only about um, quality or price, or, but do you also actually interact about food? And of course, that could even be uh, in the supermarket, uh, check the label. Increasingly, people um, here in, 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 let's say, Wageningen, I don't know Europe, huh? uh, but the, the, they are conscious of uh, buying from far away, which is not a good um, thing for, for Chile as an economy, but which may uh, be a good thing for the world as a whole. Yeah, so for some foods, anyone I can ask to, um, to uh, tell us a bit uh, for which foods typically would you check? Armando, could I ask you? Okay, and Emiliano, thank you. It's not a common practice to label. So you can't do that in the supermarkets. That's, that's a pity. Armando, what, what foods do you check usually? Armando, we, we can't hear you. You have to switch on your mic if you want. Yeah, to. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm really sorry, but I can't move my my posit. Because I don't know. I, I ah okay. You you need to go to the to the arrow again. Yeah, on the yeah, left. yeah. But yeah, because I listen to the class by my mobile phone. Ah okay. Because, because I can't very troubles in my in my computer. I'm sorry. All right. So wh where should we put your name? In no. No. Because uh, yeah, be because actually in, in the in the previous slide, I I buy my my food in the supermarket. But I'm sorry. And then we know from Emiliano that that, that it's not common practice to have labels there. Yeah. So here we 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 uh, supermarkets are obliged to tell us where, uh, what country the the food comes from, so people can decide whether to buy, don't know asparagus from uh, Zimbabwe or palta from Chile, obviously, and so on. Okay, yeah. so that's a little bit warming up to the whole idea of food, and uh, our talk about food systems. Um, I'm going to stop this sharing and I'm going to resume with uh, the, the lecture. Uh, so uh, you, we have warmed up, I hope. Uh, you certainly gave uh, your telephone a warming up by doing impossible things. Thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, the others I've, I've seen busy, so that's nice. Uh, then uh, let's go to the aim of the session and the role uh, in, the, in the block um, 
uh, that we are dealing with in the course of, uh, of Carlos now. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm starting with the learning goals. Uh, and that would be, um, first of all, at the end of this session, you understand the importance of a systems perspective. Um, so this is my ambition. Uh, and if you, if you uh, share, um, sorry, if you, if you participate, uh, then I hope I can achieve this. If I did not achieve this, then uh, I'd be most happy to, to have your feedback on that. Uh, secondly, you are able to name three key subsystems that you may be able to distinguish in food systems, and you uh, are able to talk uh, about their components, the components inside those subsystems. You can describe an example of a procedure for mapping food systems, and in fact, one of you is going to tell us about that, and I'm going to later on uh, possibly add to that. You are able to describe the differences between what uh, we call analysis-oriented research and design-oriented research. And finally, you can explain the role of grassroots innovation for food system transformation. Yeah, so these are the ambitions. Now, then, then I'll start with uh, what, um, what is a system? When we this, the word system is in, in so, used in so many contexts. So, so what, what is it? Uh, here, I want to uh, use this definition. So a system is a delimited, uh, delimited part of reality consisting of components. And then the interactions among the components inside the system are more important than uh, the interactions between the components of the system and the outside world. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, to me, uh, that means uh, two, two things. Uh, one, one is uh, a delimited part of reality. Um, we, who delimits? Well, in fact, we delimit ourselves every time we talk about system. So you can talk about uh, the economy of, of Chile as a system. So then you put the boundaries around the economy and you list maybe uh, sectors of the economy as components and the interactions between the sectors. Or you can talk about a farming system and then, yeah, where does the farming system stop? What could be the boundaries of the farm? That, that sounds reasonable, sounds logical. And then you have to decide on the components inside the farm. Right, but each time when you talk about system, realize that in fact you are suggesting a boundary and it would be nice anyway in scientific exchanges to actually tell your audience what the boundaries are and what components you then distinguish. And then the second sentence, uh, the interactions among the components are more important than the interactions with the outside world. Here, if we talk about the economic system in Chile, then uh, there are, for example, the different sectors, uh, then uh, this only makes sense if you want to talk about the economy of Chile and the different components as something that, that means something. And if the economy is completely open and the functioning of the, of the system, uh, of the economic system in Chile is really completely dependent on what is happening in the world, then there is not so much point to talk about the economic system of Chile. Same thing with a field of a farm. We can talk about a, a, a crop um, in a field on a farm, but if we think agroecologically, then that crop is part of a crop rotation, is part of uh, interactions with the nature surrounding the field or the farm. So uh, the fact that we are only defining the system then as a field system uh, in involves major limitations on uh, the interactions that we, uh, that we assume to be important. 
Yes, is that, is that clear? I, I have some examples. So there are many different systems that can be defined then, depending on the interest, the earth as a whole system, and there, there is a whole science around the earth, yeah, where the, the planet is considered as a system, a, a country, vegetable sector could be a system farm. And then the, the, the warning, as I just said, is that when we define the system wrongly, we may overlook important consequences. For instance, uh, for a long time, we didn't think much about fossil fuel use and CO2 levels in the atmosphere. So the, the planet as a system was not defined properly. We can say with hindsight, huh? looking back, uh, this whole component of the interaction between burning fossil fuels and CO2 in the atmosphere and the consequences of, of that on, um, on life on Earth has been completely overlooked. So the way we define a system is very important in, uh, in, in our discussions um, because it determines which components and which interactions we take into account and which not. Now, some examples then, um, for instance, seismic example um, at, at the level of the planet. And maybe uh, you can raise your hand if you know this uh, figure, the planetary boundaries. Do you know this figure? Have you come across it before? I don't want to duplicate. Yes, I have seen it in the um, economy studies. Okay. okay, all right. Others, be warned. If you if you don't tell me uh, you've seen it before, I I'm going to bore you with a repeat. <laughs> Did you see it? No. Okay, Claudia. Good. Um, then certainly for you, but most likely also for a number of other students. So um, these planetary boundaries were introduced by, uh, let's say, Earth system scientists. Resilience Alliance uh, is, is an organization in Sweden and uh, there are many uh, eminent people working with that Resilience Alliance. Uh, and in 2009, uh, they uh, introduced for the first time the idea of a planetary boundary. So as a planet, uh, uh, we, uh, we can only utilize our resources so much. There are boundaries to the extent that we can utilize the planet, that we can exploit the planet, you can say. So uh, they distinguished a number of domains like climate change, uh, genetic diversity, functional diversity, land use change, etc. All of these themes, let's say, and they defined what they call a safe space, uh, the circle, the, the, the smallest circle here that is green uh, for those themes that they have actually uh, studied. Uh, then the next uh, circle is this uh, uh, outer circle here, which is the maximum to which we can use the planet. And when, uh, for instance, the use of genetic diversity goes beyond this outer circle, then they say you're in a uh, high risk zone. So that's the red bits. And in fact, you are exceeding the boundaries of what the planet can sustain in terms of human exploitation. And then the yellow zone is, is, is a zone of, of uncertainty. So we're moving in the wrong direction. We're beyond uh, the safe space uh, in terms of environmental impacts, right? because the planetary boundaries are all about environmental impacts, as you can see, land use change, fresh water use, phosphorus, nitrogen flows. Uh, oceanic acidification, aerosol loading, etc. And for genetic diversity, uh, so part of biodiversity, uh, for, for the amounts of phosphorus uh, in, in, that are cycling, 
that are no longer in mines or, or in deposits, but are actually going around the world and doing a lot of damage in terms of uh, eutrophication. Nitrogen, huge amounts of nitrogen uh, that have been captured from the air by creating uh, fertilizer and that have resulted in, in uh, overloads uh, for the planet of, of nitrogen at this moment. And there are also areas where, uh, where things are still under study, where it's not clear yet, at least in 2015. For instance, these novel entities it could be uh, something related to, for instance, plastics. Oh, that's, that's a big concern that we have plastics from very large to microplastics uh, all over the planet. And can we deal with that? Can the planet deal with that? Aerosols. Uh, just this morning in a newspaper, I read about uh, the, the fact that the World Health Organization has not found any country um, where there is not, uh, where, uh, has not found a, a country where there is a safe level of aerosols. So inside our air that we breathe, there are these um, uh, micro particles uh, coming from uh, combustion, uh, burning of wood and so on, but also from the industry that we inhale and that ultimately uh, are not uh, are not healthy. So there's an additional load of people dying from um, uh, aerosol loading and so on. So that's the idea of a system perspective. I think it's a very uh, captivating picture. Look at the world as a, as a whole and define what it can sustain. And Walter, uh, yes. Emiliana has a question. Okay, ah, very good. Yes, please, go ahead. Hi, Walter, good morning. I, mean, I have no. a question relating about the genetic diversity. I think that um, beyond the zone of uncertainty, uh, it means that we are using um, a decreasing amount of genetic diversity, right? Yes, uh, using, using, uh, this is also very much uh, related to uh, biodiversity. So in fact, it is us contributing to a, a big decrease in biodiversity. We are depleting biodiversity yes. of, of the planet. But, As, yeah. but we, we, we don't have yet um, the, the threshold of functional diversity that we need, right? To sustain life on earth. Could, could that be that we need um, um, a, a little amount of diversity, functional diversity to sustain life? Uh, yes, so- To a base level. Yeah, very good point. So I, I see uh, 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 the confusion. So in, in terms of this uh, biodiversity, genetic diversity, functional diversity, the red parts are really to do with um, humanity, decreasing uh, the level of biodiversity and functional uh, diversity. Whereas when you look at phosphorus and nitrogen, it's really humanity over increasing, huh? having too much. On the one hand, we have too little of the biodiversity or increasingly less. And uh, in terms of phosphorus and nitrogen, we have increasingly more and what they put in red here, too much, right? So red doesn't always mean too much. In this case, it, it, it actually means too little. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So uh, then the question, have we now defined sustainability? Yes, no, what do you think? Just open your microphone and shout. Yes. Then we're done. <laughs> All together. One, two, three. Open your microphone. Yes or no? No. Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> you say yes because I said you were done. You you wanted to you, you want to stop here. I think not. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid yeah. it's the answer is no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I heard some no's. 
uh, so look at this, for instance. So we've looked at uh, we've looked at this ecological ceiling. No, and we're, we're talking about overshoot. So too much of this or too little of that. But we also have a kind of social foundation of our of our planet. Uh, it's inhabited. There are humans there. Uh, unfortunately for the planet, you could almost say. Uh, very fortunate for us, but uh, still there are consequences. So what about this social foundation then? It's not only ecology and environment, it's also the, the interhuman aspect. And in between these two, and that's uh, maybe uh, one of you uh, uh, having heard about this in, in the in economics courses, could be the, the donut economics idea where Kate Rayworth already in, um, some years ago wrote this book, which was very important for the um, uh, uh, sustainable development goals development. Yeah, they, they use this idea of, well, don't use more of the planet than the ecological ceiling, but use at least as much to get a social foundation. And then in between uh, this donut, then, uh, so here's a hole where we don't want to be, here's the outside where we don't want to be, but in between is then the safe and just space for humanity. And more in detail, you see again on the outside here, the planetary boundaries, but on the inside here, you see now themes of, of the social uh, part of our societies, uh, energy, uh, water, food, networks, housing, gender equality, social equity, etc. And in many of these domains, there is also concern, also reason for concern, where there is tremendous uh, undershoot, let's say, shortfall here, you see on the left, huh? shortfall and overshoot, where we really need to get better at, at giving people a political voice at uh, uh, creating peace and justice, well, Europe uh, very clearly, but of course all over the world, etc. And health care, uh, food to a certain degree, it's, in terms of food, uh, the world was getting better and the number of uh, people who are um, hungry is going down and down, but on the other hand, the number of people with, with uh, uh, obesity is going up and up. So both cases there there is a health problem okay so sustainability at least uh, the environmental aspect ecological aspect and the social uh, aspect and then between those two we can look for economic systems that can yeah uh, uh, contribute to that uh, to that continuation of the earth and she calls that uh, the safe and just space for humanity to develop the economy. Appealing idea. So in this lecture, we're, we're not talking about the donut, we're talking about agricultural systems. So then the question is after these slides, which components are we talking about? And uh, maybe sets of components or subsystems. Now, are we talking about this, oh, sorry, I, I can't see it anymore, but you can, I hope. Uh, Walter, there is some question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, very good. I have, I have a question for the page before. Yeah, I'll go back. Why some part of red in the inside of the donuts is breaking like in the middle yeah so so in order to uh, to address that we need to go into much more detail because here in fact uh, there are all the time uh, multiple indicators you can say and in some indicators like here in water uh, the uh, uh, the shortfall is less than in another indicator so there we would need to go into really the details of how, um, how this uh, shortfall was, was um, 
uh, quantified. Okay, so the breaking line is because you have different variety, variable, variable, variables in the in the inside of that water or food or health items. That is precisely uh, yes. Okay. Correct. Uh, but the, the, there is a comment also in the chat. The chat, yeah, I'm reading yeah. it now. Okay, Emiliano, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's about, um, yeah, uh, you, you can all see it. Uh, can we, do we need all that biodiversity? Uh, from a human perspective, uh, and uh, there there are um, serious debates about this. Uh, so, you know, the dinosaurs they are extinct. Do we really miss them? For instance, uh, but of course there is there is uh, the whole consideration of um, uh, uh, being careful. Uh, I've I've the English word doesn't doesn't come to mind, uh, but being careful. We don't know exactly what we are uh, doing when we lose a lot of biodiversity, because we don't know exactly the mechanism, let's say, of how uh, the planet works in detail. So if we lose certain uh, key elements, then it may be, you, you have heard of, of this, uh, of these, um, uh, tipping points, it could be that in some places, if you pass a certain level of, uh, of decrease of uh, biodiversity, you fall down into a, a deep hole, let's say, in terms of uh, ecosystem functioning, that it will be very difficult to get out of. So I think it's, it's this precautionary principle, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah, principio, <laughs> perfect, yeah, Mariana. You did it. Um, so this precautionary principle um, uh, would, would uh, suggest uh, that we are careful in just continuing on this road to eliminating flies. Who needs flies? Huh? Uh, they're a nuisance. But there are really a lot less flies uh, around than, uh, I mean, even when I was young um 40 50 years ago so does that matter but there are these effects further up in the food chain and so on that that make that uh yeah we need to be precautionary and that's not and that's not very interesting as a principle for politicians or for decision makers of course because you don't know what you're doing wrong until you 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 are down in the in the valley uh, that you don't want to be. Okay, two good points. Thank you. So the subsystems. Huh? So here are a lot of flows, uh, crops uh, harvested uh, by animals or by the farmer, storage, um, manure going back to the soil and so on. So are these the components that, that you think um, make up an agricultural system, or can we simplify a bit where we say livestock produces manure, which goes to the land, crops. So this is an idea of a circular food system, of, uh, of an agro system, not so much a food system. But... And then, of course, if you, if, you have, um, if you have this, can you scale this up to the planet as a whole? Yeah, Mariana, that, that's also a fair comment. Mm -hmm. So to um, Emiliano's uh, uh, question about functionality, is, is nature important in itself or, or is it only there for us? Uh, this, this functional perspective. Good, uh, that could be the farm, huh? this circular food system perspective. Um, but why not take also the landscape into account? Here we see some green forests uh, around the, the fields. Are they of importance? 
Uh, and for what are they important? Do we therefore need to include them as a kind of a landscape perspective in, in thinking about agro -syst agricultural systems? Uh, do we need to take the value chains into account, uh, the, the supermarkets and what, what kind of demands they have? Are they part of the system or do we say, okay, there's a certain demand of, of the supermarkets and we consider only the production system of agriculture? Because agriculture cannot affect the demand of the supermarkets, right? We don't need to include them because the interactions between the agricultural world and the food system, uh, and, and sorry, and the supermarkets is really minimal. Farmers don't have any power in relation to food systems. So we don't, we can just assume that supermarkets have a demand, but not that the demand changes because of actions of, uh, of uh, farmers. And then should we include consumers? Can consumers actually change relevant things inside our system, our agricultural system, or are they just outside absorbing whatever the, the, the supermarkets uh, want to sell them, or, or are they actually exchanging with uh, street markets, farmers, uh, small shops about what they want to buy, and are these signals then coming back to the farms? And finally, of course, all of us as citizens, to what extent are we included and to what extent are trends in our uh, ideas, are they relevant to, uh, uh, to what happens in the agricultural system? So here's what, what, what I think uh, a fascinating uh, study from one of our national uh, planning bureaus already from a couple of years ago, I think 2015 or so. But here you see the concentrations in the Dutch food chain uh, with 65,000 farmers and horticulturalists here. And they produce, well, a little bit through farmers markets so that 7 million shoppers who shop food for 17 million inhabitants, uh, people, uh, can buy food directly at farmers markets. But the majority uh, of farm products is processed by food manufacturers, 6,500, 1,500 suppliers, they pull it all together and then they say, okay, we're going to sell to five purchasing companies, only five, who are in fact part of uh, supermarkets. So there are then 15 supermarket concepts or, or 25, so different brands, let's say. But they all uh, have aggregated their, their purchases through these purchasing companies. And then you see the actual supermarkets, 4,400 and the shoppers and so on. So you see, uh, in, in this interesting picture, it's one way of representing a, a, um, a system, I would think, uh, from farmers to consumers. Uh, but you can also immediately see how many there are. So this whole system only depends on numbers, numbers of, uh, of, um, of farmers, numbers of manufacturers, etc. And striking, of course, to see this huge power of, uh, of the supermarkets who where five companies determine what I like, because only that's uh, what they think I like, I can buy in the supermarket. Now, from a system perspective, uh, other numbers are missing. So the farm input suppliers are missing. The, the, the number of information providers, advisors, um, the, the number of waste processors, uh, there in, in all parts of these, uh, this chain, there, there is waste. You can also add the number of, let's say, policy uh, regulations uh, uh, that are going to the farmers uh, and to others in, in that chain are all missing. So this is not a complete system perspective, but it is a, a sort of, uh, a, 
this is the way this system has been defined. And that was done to show the concentration uh, of power in between farmers and consumers. Yeah, that's why probably they, they left out the input suppliers. So the lesson here is not so much that you actually know how many purchasing companies there are in the Netherlands, uh, but uh, the lesson is that um, you define a system based on uh, your objective uh, in what you want to study inside that system and what you want to, uh, uh, yeah, what you want to analyze, right? So a, a generic system does not exist. You define the system time and every time you, uh, in relation to your goals. Good. Now then from system, we move to food system and uh, maybe to you, uh, food system is, is a well-known term, but it's really not that old. It's, it's at least in, by my standards, not that old. Uh, so the term food system e emerged as a concept uh, really in, uh, in response to food security. Um, at some point, uh, uh, the sustainable development goals, but also the millennium, uh, ecos uh, millennium ecosystem goals, they, um, they showed the enormous more than 1 billion people uh, uh, be going hungry every day. And then the idea came up, well, what can we do about this food insecurity of all these people? And uh, slowly uh, the realization came that by looking at sectors or you know, the industrial sector or the energy sector, transport sector, agricultural sector, that's not enough. We need to look at uh, the, the way food is produced and consumed and everything in between. And if, if you want to look up uh, some history, the uh, Polly Erickson in 2008 wrote a very nice paper I put here in Global Environmental Change, is, is the journal. Uh, John Ingram did that again. They, they, I think they're from the same group in Oxford um, in food security, where they said, well, we, we can distinguish a, a number of sets of activities in, in the food system. And <clears throat> I hope you can read this, producing food, processing and packaging, and that's doing something to those foods, distributing and retailing, so bringing it elsewhere, and then finally consuming. So those are the four categories of activities, and they result in outcomes. So what does the food system result in? <clears throat> Uh, and uh, which contribute to social welfare and environmental welfare or not. Huh? Um, and the stability of this food security over time. And we then need to think in terms of food security, in terms of three big categories, the food utilization, the way food is used, the access to food, and the availability of food. Now, and as agronomists, <clears throat> uh, we're very much used to um, talk about production um, and, and basically that's it, right? Maybe nutritional value. But what you see here is that there is a lot more to food than just the availability slash the production. There's also the distribution. Does, how does it, come out of the farm and reach uh, the, the, uh, the consumer. Uh, does it reach the consumer? Are there, are there problems uh, there? Um, uh, the exchange, is it exchanged in terms of money or is it exchanged in terms of services or is it exchanged in terms of other foods? So that's, that all contributes to food utilization. Uh, availability, sorry. And then the excess, we may have foods, uh, and I'll show you examples of that later on, uh, but maybe uh, people can just not afford it, cannot, do not have the money to buy it. Um, maybe 
it's not available where people live. And maybe it is of a, a kind that people don't like. And then finally, in terms of food utilization, nutritional value, and, and you maybe have heard about empty calories uh, with, with um, uh, the, um, uh, the soft drinks uh, giving us a lot of energy, uh, but uh, basically not feeding us. Uh, and with a lot of processed food also having a lot of empty calories, fats and, and carbohydrates that do not really feed us, but contribute to us increasing in weight. Then the social value in, of the food utilization. Um, food is more than just uh, putting it into your mouth so that your, your body can function. It's also part of, of rituals and, and of traditions. And some foods are very much go with certain festivities and so on. So that's all uh, also part of uh, the food system outcomes. And then finally, of course, food safety. Can you eat or drink things without uh, getting sick? So, so this is a much richer picture of the food system and what it produces uh, than just amounts. And uh, over, the, over those years, over those last uh, 10, 15 years, people have started to look into uh, the, the, the various aspects much more. And also as part of this, the, the whole uh, insight in the amounts of waste uh, that are part of this food system uh, have, have started to emerge. And we realize much better now that, well, one third or a quarter um, of, our, of our food coming from the farms is wasted somewhere, either in our kitchens, or somewhere in between the farm and the kitchen. So, is this okay so far? I have a question. Yes, please. Um, how do we draw the boundaries of this system? Because the system is supposed to have boundaries, as you said before. And in the examples was like a farm, a field, which looks easier to do it. But now how we do we draw the boundaries here? so much things that are as the problems become more complex we have to look at uh, more complex systems as well it's inevitable um, but you also have to realize that, uh, for instance, analyses of the, the uh, UK uh, and the English and Scottish and, and Wales uh, food system, which have been made. Uh, there is a very famous report uh, of uh, the uh, Lancet Eat. I'll put that in the chat. Lancet. Lancet, like uh, the, um, the medical journal, Lancet Eat report, um, that really tried to take such a food system perspective. Uh, and of course, you need many people to together work uh, to arrive at, uh, at such uh, um, uh, analytical results. But then you have something at, at the country level, and you have something that uh, you uh, you can also use in in your uh, policy making. So, is it easy? No, it's not easy. Otherwise, maybe these problems would not have occurred. But because we have such a global uh, society, I mean, I'm talking from Wageningen to you in Chile, uh, but the same happens to exchanges of food. We we need to uh, take that complexity into into account. And uh, well, it's very clear that different groups working together are then needed, each group doing um, a component, but together sharing uh, a system perspective that allows to put those components together. Not a completely satisfactory answer, I'm, I'm sure, but um, th this is, 
uh, what, what is now called for uh, and where research can definitely play a role. Okay, Claudia, I think uh, you were the question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Aloysia, uh, energy, energy in the food or energy coming from the sun or how do you mean that? Energy in the food. Yeah, so increasingly uh, indeed uh, uh, energy in the food uh, is taken into account. So, uh, and that's already a step beyond the kilos, uh, but it's uh, what feeds us is not only energy, it's also vitamins, it's uh, energy protein balances, it's uh, fibers that our body needs. So these kind of things uh, become more and more important. There is, for instance, a, a, a large uh, a development program where uh, international scientific organization and agriculture are working together that um, uh, is referred to as um, uh, as nutrition dense landscapes so they are looking at at the landscape level and all the people living in that landscape uh, and they are looking at the nutritional density of what is produced in those landscapes and what people uh, can use. So there they are looking at, well, how much vitamin A does a person of a certain age need? How much energy given the activity of the person? How much protein, etc. So uh, this food system idea has also caused uh, food system scientists to work uh, uh, much closer together with, with um, uh, agronomists and then look at, at uh, uh, spatially coherent uh, regions. Okay, I'll move on to uh, a perspective that, uh, that has been used in, in that paper of uh, Daniel Gaetan, and that is the multi-level perspective. It's, this is the, the name of the concept. And the concept uh, came from a Dutch uh, person, uh, Gales, uh, in, in 2002, and has been also used by uh, people who, who made this graph, two sociologists from Wagen, uh, Roep and Biskerke. And um, uh, uh, Gales, he, he studied um, innovation. And he studied how, what happened in the time that the sailing boats were replaced by motor vessels. So this is 150, yeah, I think 150 years ago, um, industrial revolution. Uh, before that, important role for sailing ships, uh, ships with their sails. And, now we're quite used to all these huge motor vessels. So what happened? How did this, that change happen? And he, he studied that in order to understand better uh, changes that are going on at this moment. Uh, energy transitions uh, to renewable energy, um, electric cars replacing uh, fossil fuel cars, etc. And as part of those studies, he came up with uh, this idea. And so here on the x-axis down here, we see the past, the present, and the future. And here we have, well, what, what he calls institutionalization of practices. So uh, let's say, I, I called it here the level from the local to the world level uh, at which certain practices are, are common, are generally accepted. Yeah, maybe the practice of using electrical cars. Is that a, a local practice or is it a world practice? Well, if it's a local pr uh, practice, then 
he calls that that a, a niche or a niche. Uh, so like the niche in, in ecology, very local, very tiny, uh, but uh, there is something there. If it's uh, more generally common, then he calls it regime. So it doesn't have anything to do with government, but he calls it the normal way of operating. He calls that regime. And you can have regimes for agriculture and regimes for energy use, uh, regimes for, um, for transportation, uh, etc. Yeah, so there are regimes. And we all live in a world full of regimes in that sense, these sociological regimes. And then finally, uh, he talks about landscape. Again, very confusing for us uh, agroecologists, but this landscape is a social landscape. It is the way we, well, the world sees things at the moment. And of course, that is dynamic. It, it's not always the same. I've highlighted here a little bit more close to home. So for instance, ecological intensification, I think it's at the moment a niche. It concerns farms, it concerns value chains, it concerns innovation systems. So everybody around the farms and the value chains that, that, that uh, uh, influence them, that we call innovation systems. So, but that's a niche. And some of those niches, they actually make it to the regime. Uh, so here are constant, the niches are constant sources of inspiration, of change, of people who want to do something different, who think they have a good idea. And for some of these niches, actually the number of people using them goes up. So hence the arrows up. But at some point also interest goes down again, wasn't such a good idea on to the next. But some of those ideas sort of come together and they actually create or find themselves as a new regime, a new way of doing things. So these are, in fact, the established food systems, you can say. And certainly in, in, uh, in the affluent world, uh, organic farming uh, or, or organic products are a regime. It's well organized, it's certified, it's all costly and so on, but it's part of the regime. And then at the final level, uh, we would have global perspectives on food. So this whole idea of, uh, uh, of nutritional density that, that uh, uh, we just talked about, um, the energy and food uh, and all the other things is shaping the social landscape, let's say. And that social landscape, well, uh, is influenced by early thinking about uh, food insecurity that then became part of mainstream thinking in science and that then influenced ultimately uh, policymakers here at this level and uh, here at, at this landscape level. Yeah. So that's the multi-level perspective. And you can also think in terms of uh, the different food systems in Chile, like Daniel did, um, uh, collaborating with, with Carlos and, and uh, the, the team in, in Quixota. Uh, what are the regimes in, uh, in Chile on vegetable food systems? What are niches, what are regimes, and, and how uh, should we evaluate their performance? That later. Now, I think the structure of our, of our three courses, or three lectures, is first of all that Mariana is going to talk about uh, the ecological intensification niche from an Uruguayan perspective, which is super interesting and has evolved over uh, the last uh, 20 years. Um, Santiago is going to talk about uh, the, um, the, the processes that are involved in um, scaling out uh, the, um, uh, the ecological intensification efforts. So how are farmers uh, getting together 
uh, with researchers, uh, with policymakers, and making this ecological intensification part of the regime and what is hindering them and how can science uh, help uh, or readjust itself uh, to, uh, to make this kind of uh, change happen. Assuming that ecological intensification is better than, uh, than our current um, intensification, uh, fossil fuel based intensification. And then I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, this concept as a whole. Um, and so we have split up these, uh, uh, these lectures in this way. Is that a little bit clear? So you see, and if you look around you and, and you see, and you, you look at, at farms or uh, shops or street markets that do things in a new way, hopefully uh, this weekend when you go to them, you, uh, you will think in terms of niches. People are trying something different and they are trying to wait for, they are waiting for feedback. And if it, if it works well, they continue and maybe somebody else picks it up. And ultimately, more people do it to such a level that we think, ah, this is normal. This is the way it happens on street markets or on uh, organic farms or whatever. Uh, and this is actually the way it should be. So you have rules and regulations and, and then you arrive at, uh, at the regime level. Miliano, uh, is, is your hand still up or did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. It might be a dumb question, and I'm sorry, <laughs> but before the Green Revolution, uh, sustainable agriculture was part of the last landscape, right? Like the landscape level. So right? I'm, I'm silent. So this was not a dumb question at all. <laughs> I, I suppose it, it was not part of, of the... Um, a mindset of people to think about anything else than uh, agriculture as being hard work and doing things in a particular way. And then the in industrial revolution came and external inputs and, and the whole thing started to ultimately um, uh, become part of, of that landscape in, in the sense of this is how you do proper agriculture. So, so yes, but Back but it could it could it could sustain civilizations, right? So I'm thinking that maybe we can go back to that, or is it like an utopia? Ah, yeah. So so this is just schematic. I'm not taking any position. So uh, uh, from this perspective, I think that what Mariana is doing uh, with uh, her farmers and, and Santiago is really affecting uh, regimes, maybe regimes um, um, uh, at, at, at a local scale where, uh, well, before the government changed in Uruguay, there was a, a national um, agroecology plan under development. So that was really something where uh, the ideas here at the niche level invaded the regime. Yeah, almost were ready to be taken up by policies and by being generally accepted in Uruguay. And why not also go here? In Europe, we now have uh, agroecology also as a, as a key strategy uh, for 2030, 2030 for our food system. So the Euro European Union has taken a food system perspective and of course it's difficult but it does uh, mean that those kind of ideas can become part of the landscape again. Good. Maybe Walter, can, could I say something because I don't know if I understood Emiliano what you're saying is that we could consider like the the, the time before uh, the green revolution like start and develop all, all around the world we could say okay 
that situation was uh, the sustainable situation that we want now to go back again. It's something like that that you mentioned. But maybe we can we can like um, uh, keep this question that you made now, and we could also uh, think about uh, this again in the next uh, lecture, most focus at, at farm level and, and how to work and design farm level, because we could also discuss, okay, those that situation previous to Green Revolution was a, a sustainable situation. And I don't know, maybe here in Uruguay, we were doing things very wrong also related to soil management, not with fertilizers, but with other type of management. So maybe it's something that is uh, nice to keep in mind and, and we can discuss it uh, in the next uh, lecture, most focus at farm level or management at farm level. Yeah. That was, yeah. sorry, Walter. Yeah. No, very good. So, so the idea is also uh, uh, exactly what you're doing now is to to make clear to uh, to all of you how these different lectures uh, uh, relate to each other. Right? There is this block on agricultural systems, and you have three lectures. Are they just three people brought together? No. There, there is a there is a, a, a logic to us being here together. Mariana, Santiago, and I. Good, yes. Um, okay, so there is this food system idea then, and, and uh, the integrated nature of the food system. But look at how science is organized. We have agronomy, we have economics, we have agroecology, all these different departments at, at, the, at my university, maybe at your university as well. Uh, or ministries, agriculture, fighting with economics, fighting with mining, maybe in Chile, um, and so on. Yeah. So we have organized ourselves uh, in fragments that need to become reconnected at different levels from uh, maybe the farmers that have become very specialized on certain types of crops only. Uh, versus much more diversification, but also in terms of, uh, uh, and, and this is something Mariana is going to talk about as well, uh, advisors who know everything about one crop, but don't see the farming system as a whole, uh, up to uh, scientists who, who are fragmented in their specializations and, and policy makers in their ministries. Yeah, so, uh, the fact that we are now a global world means that uh, our neighbors uh, cannot compensate for what we cannot do. The neighbors are the stars, yeah? So now we need to solve it ourselves and make, make those connections. Yeah, so that completes the, the aim of uh, this session and, and the role of this session in, in the block uh, Sistemas Agricolas Sostenibles. Um, I'm very happy that you are asking questions as we go along. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe it's time for a little break. Do you feel like that? Yeah, that's Shall fine. we take 10 minutes? Yes, yeah? please. Yay. Okay, good. Is, is 10 minutes okay, 15? Um, Carlos, can you help me? What, what is custom bathroom time? I think 15 minutes is fine. 15 minutes, okay. Um, back at, yeah. Oh, what is that for, for you? 10, 10.35 or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, see you then. See ya. Inside, uh, uh, in Uruguay and, and Chile. So these e emerging economy characteristics that we listed then is that, well, typically as economies grow, more people move to urban areas. Uh, associated with economic growth, in many cases, uh, is also an increasingly unequal income 
distribution with more and fewer very rich and many more uh, poor people. And, and the, the, the middle uh, then increasing um, as time goes by, um, but the, the uh, overall indicators of equal income distribution uh, uh, show are showing more an inequality. The same holds for the health status, and I'll give you some some only examples from Uruguay and Chile. Uh, and associated with that economic growth is also major environmental and social concerns. Uh, not only because of the health and the income distribution, but also related to fertilizer and pesticide use, so to the environmental component. Um, food security, nutrition, you recognize these terms uh, now since the previous slides, uh, I hope. And in fact, uh, there is a lot of research going to, uh, to low income countries, uh, trying to uh, help them get out of poverty, and that's completely fair, but as uh, humanity becomes more successful, so most countries are emerging economies, what, what kind of problems does, does that give us as a society and hence the uh, justification of our research. And we then concentrated on vegetable food systems, so uh, you just asked, uh, well, what about food systems? Well, we even only took a slice out of the food systems, the vegetable ones. Now to, to give a bit more data on, uh, on, on this emerging economy characteristics for Uruguay and Chile, here on the left is Chile, on the right is Uruguay. You see that uh, anyway in 2013, according to this WHO, World Health Organization data, uh, you had you know, around 90%, living in cities in Chile uh, and even 95% uh, in Uruguay. Um, you see, uh, this is data from, from uh, Uruguay. I, I left out the, the Chilean one because the figure was not very clear. You see that um, compared to uh, the 400 grams of vegetables and 200 grams of fruits per day that is recommended by the world health organization, you see that even the 5% richest uh, people in Uruguay in this case, were not quite achieving that level. So uh, a lack of uh, healthy uh, nutrition, let's say, but uh, maybe more important, uh, you see how uh, the, the consumption of fruits and, and uh, vegetables is highly uh, unequal between the, the income classes. And with this greater uh, separation of rich and poor in emerging economies, this should really be uh, a point of attention. And uh, I can add that also in the Netherlands, which is a high income country, we see that uh, the, um, the poorer people, they eat a lot le less healthy, and we get uh, recent uh, uh, outcries also because they live uh, shorter. Uh, they, on average, males uh, in the lowest income categories in the Netherlands live six years shorter than males in the high income uh, uh, category. That, that's outrageous, isn't it? Just because you're poor, you also live uh, less long. You have less chances in that respect. And in addition, you have, uh, I think, 15 more years of poor health compared to the high income person. So those are inequalities that are related to, um, uh, to diets and to food systems. And if we then look at the world perspective, also data from World Health Organization, um, you see that, uh, well, the, the consumption of, uh, of vegetables is in fact, uh, paradoxically, uh, only high uh, in, in low income countries uh, where, where there are no food processing industries or much less so than in the high income uh, countries like um, in Chile, uh, in Argentina and in Uruguay. 
and where the consumption is, is uh, well, at the level of one third or one fourth of uh, the recommended consumption of, uh, of vegetables. And as, as one of the consequences, they say, uh, there is also uh, are quite some effects even uh, in children, where in Uruguay, uh, the data for that year, uh, 2008, 13 and 14, were uh, overweight kids, uh, less than five years old, uh, and uh, some effects on uh, kids being uh, shorter than their uh, then what would be a normal, let's say, whatever normal is for, um, uh, for their age and, and wasting means uh, being much thinner than you should be, so underweight. And I, I understand that underweight, I had to look it up, underweight is really a combination of stunting, so being too short and wasting, where you lose, where you are uh, too light. And then Chile, for a little bit different year, so it's not, not possible to, com to compare uh, precisely, but you see maybe similar scores, maybe a little less in terms of obesity, but the other scores are quite substantial huh? with the stunting, uh, kids being too small uh, and, uh, and uh, wasting. So these are terrible figures. Uh, uh, as, as a country, they are not unique to Chile and Uruguay, they're also uh, there for uh, for higher uh, income for high income countries, but maybe much more separated out per income category within the country. So in Ortega, we then said the problem is that vegetable food systems in emerging economies provide insufficient, insufficiently accessible, and unsafe vegetables. Uh, and I haven't shown you any data on unsafe, but I'm sure uh, Mariana will, uh, in terms of pesticide use and, and uh, also maybe in terms of uh, um, um, nutrient uh, use, although uh, we then would still need to make the translation to the, the contents of nitrates, for instance, in vegetables, which, which are not healthy, particularly for small children. And this exacerbates and makes worse lifestyle related health issues. So that, that, that was the problem we, uh, we defined in Horteco. And then the vision was that um, safe vegetables would be grown without pesticides by fairly rewarded farmers. And these vegetables would be plentiful, available and accessible by the population. So you see on the one hand, uh, we take a, a, a food system approach where we, uh, uh, as I will show in the next slides, where we included the producers and the market conditions they work in uh, and they organize themselves in, uh, and the innovation system. Um, on the other hand, we only take a few indicators of that partial vegetable food system, availability and accessibility. All right, but th there is this systemic vision. And then the mission, so what we want to accomplish in, in the lifetime of the project, because this is something that needs to develop over maybe a generation or more. So in Chile and Uruguay, develop and combine scientific and local knowledge on production and marketing of high value, low or no pesticide vegetables. Yeah, so here we, as scientists, we really wanted to also combine with local knowledge. So, and as I said uh, briefly already at the, at the start of the project, um, uh, in Uruguay, we, we saw 20 years of collaboration on transdisciplinary ecological identification of agricultural production. And in Chile, there were first contacts with uh, the local team and there was a project idea. So very different contexts uh, for, for this uh, uh, project as well. But the drive in, in both uh, uh, countries and also by the team uh, support team from, from my university was to um, develop scientific activities, but change supporting towards these low or no pesticide vegetables based on a transdisciplinary approach. 
Um, yeah, so what, what kind of system perspective did, did we have? So we, we said this, the black box is the vegetable food system. And we distinguished three subsystems that were connected. The production system, so the farms, uh, the farm types, um, the value chain or the value ch chain types and the innovation system or the innovation system types. Now the innovation system is a bit of a vague notion, but these are really all the, uh, all the people and all the structures, all the organizations around production and around marketing um, that make sure that uh, production and value chain systems function. So it could be advisors, could be um, teachers, could be uh, people from the government who facilitate certain uh, uh, processes, who facilitate uh, training of farmers, who facilitate or organize the, the training of, uh, uh, of extension agents, uh, advisors, or who enforce certain uh, rules. Yeah, that, that's the innovation system. And then of course, we consider these uh, out system, uh, uh, food system outcomes and their goals. And we did so under the external influence of, well, whatever environment drivers in the countries, um, socioeconomic drivers and their interactions. And these systems are not uh, fixed. They change over time. And uh, during the lifetime of Arteco, you had the, the big social uh, changes taking place in Chile. So what uh, kind of effects did that have on the food system? And what, what kind of consequences could we uh, then uh, find for farm organizations, but also for what we thought would be promising food systems? So uh, there, you, you see that that um, uh, changes uh, everywhere. Now, how, a question to you then is this transdisciplinarity, how, how do you see that? When I made this presentation, I was wondering, well, how do you, as uh, PhD, MSc students, BSc students, how do you see transdisciplinarity? What, what is that? You can either speak out or you can, you can do it in the chat. You can do it in Spanish. Desde mi perspectiva, no se puede hablar. Eh, sí, sí, puede ser. No, no, no. Eh, se da poco la, la transdisciplinaridad en los estudios porque normalmente estamos eh, limitados, ¿no es cierto?, por nuestros propios centros de estudio donde nos agrupan por nuestra especialidad. Y es muy difícil eh, formar grupos transdisciplinarios Eso creo, pero de, es lo que debiésemos hacer. Es difícil de hacerlo, pero creo que es lo que debiésemos hacer. Vale, es difícil hacerlo, pero para ti, ¿qué, qué quiere decir eh, un proyecto transdisciplinario? Incluye especialistas de distintas áreas trabajando alrededor del mismo fenómeno. Vale. Y... Vale. Otra, uh, uh, ¿Otras opiniones? En uh, el chat hay un comentario de Emiliano. So uh, Emiliano, also uh, for you, it's uh, uh, agronomists and other uh, scientific disciplines working together. So can I then ask, what, what is the difference between uh, transdisciplinary and 
multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Those are also terms, right? I'll put it in the chat. Multi. What, what is the difference with transdisciplinary? So we're in agreement that Maybe. monodisciplinarity is, is the agronomist, let's say, uh, and then you start to add new disciplines. Uh, be yeah. Because why? Why would you, why would you bother? In this case, I think instead of having different professionals, maybe having the agronomist to have different disciplines, uh, reinforcing environmental resources, reinforcing everything that is related with social issues. Um, so it's, it could be one person, one team, maybe all of them are agronomists, but they do have a deeper knowledge of these other things that affect the uh, production. Okay, I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh... The label agronomist uh, can represent many different disciplines. Yeah, totally in agreement. And, and you are saying, well, in, in fact, what I, what I think I hear you say is, is that the problem uh, in the field, let's say, requires different disciplinary uh, perspectives. Exactly. There is more comment in the chat also. Yeah. Okay, transdisciplinary. So, so you see transdisciplinary cells so very much as uh, uh, the different um, ways of, of uh, analyzing uh, the world in one person. Think as an ecologist, agronomist, economist, and multidisciplinary is you're an expert and there is another expert and another expert. And Aloysia, uh, different opinions, approaches to common theme. It also integrates the part of the social role. What, what do you mean by the social role of whom? I think consumers should be included here, not only the people that works in the farm and all the you know, work ethics and everything that you had to take care of, but also how the consumers, the demand uh, behave. Okay, all right. So let's say th these are the people um, who hopefully uh, benefit from, from the scientists work, right? So now, now we're getting already outside of the realm of science. And uh, I think the way uh, I understand the transdisciplinarity is exactly that, where you say, well, you can have monodisciplines where one discipline is looking at a certain problem, but many of our relevant problems for society require multiple disciplines or uh, uh, multiple. So many different uh, scientists around the same problem, but they could still all be doing their own thing. So that's multidisciplinary. And to me then the next level, let's say of collaboration around uh, a problem is interdisciplinary. So where the scientists say, ah, oh, how does that look uh, from the social science side? How does that look from the ecology side? And uh, I'm an agronomist, so I'm, I'm going to try and take your perspectives on board. That's the interdisciplinarity. But it's still only, only scientists. So when we then move to transdisciplinarity, we also say, well, 
we don't know. We only know from our own perspectives uh, as scientists. But how about if we include uh, non-scientist uh, wisdom uh, as part of the uh, of as part of the analysis and as part of the solution as well? So to me, this transdisciplinary uh, aspect is uh, uh, researchers not only doing analytical research, analyzing the, pr the problem, but at the same time also uh, giving back to the farmers and understanding how the farmers uh, think and uh, what kind of solutions farmers have. Uh, and in addition to only using the, far using the farmers as, uh, now give me a problem. Do you, um, do you have a problem with uh, Ilaria uh, or some, some other problem? This is yeah. like maybe this, you know, the projects that are financed by these international cooperation agencies, they always require this socialization, not only to the people that is in the project, but the people that is around the project. So you have to consider all of them when you develop the project. Yes. And it's not only to consider uh, it uh, uh, with uh, people in society, but in fact also to adjust your scientific work to what uh, will help them further. Right, so uh, maybe we can come to that, uh, how Horteca worked um, uh, uh, in, in that way. Uh, and certainly you are going to hear much more about this from uh, Mariana. Okay, but transdisciplinary was a very important uh, component of, uh, of our thinking. So uh, here again, uh, the summary, uh, I'll, I'll share the, the slides with you uh, afterwards uh, through Carlos. Um, multiple scientific disciplines, but also involving societal actors in all phases of the research. So we had people from your ministry, um, uh, uh, Carlos brought them along from farmer organizations, individual farmers, um, meetings with them to also discuss what we were researching and if we should change that or not. So that, that's very different from saying, okay, uh, scientists um, determine at the beginning of the project what will be done and they just do it. And then at the end of the project, write a publication and hope that societal actors uh, read them, <laughs> which is of course uh, not very likely because it's very technical uh, jargon. Yeah, so it, this requires a change in the, in the mindset of the scientists with very specific methods for understanding each other. Uh, um, both the, the other scientists, but also the, the societal people from a system perspective. Uh, learning about each other's views. So this is called social learning. So if I understand what you're what you find important, or I understand what, what, uh, what your values are maybe. Huh? Then, uh, and I include that in my own uh, worldview or view on the problem, then that is called social learning. Uh, learning about others and learning with others. And then finally, the third element uh, of that specific methods that we used was keeping track if the project and the people are moving in the desired direction. So you, you want to go to um, low or no pesticide vegetables. Well, how do we measure that? How do farmers um, uh, think they should, what kind of information they need to see if they are on the right track? And again, I, I refer to Mariana's and, and uh, Santiago's presentations to make that more concrete. And finally, commit to a mission. So transdisciplinary research, working with actors in society means you have to team up together. So you can't just say, well, science is value free, it's neutral. No, you, you, may, you, you can make it very clear that you're being a good scientist with good, proper scientific methods, but still committed to uh, certain types uh, of uh, groups in society. So that was the idea in, in our deco.
So <clears throat> that uh, transformation towards these uh, low or no pesticide systems, we, we formulate it in this way. So here we have the production system, uh, the specialized production system with only a few components of the system. This is in abstract, uh, this is conceptual. Only a few components of the system mobilized. Let's say uh, uh, the amount of nutrients in the soil and the crop, something like that. Uh, high levels of inputs to keep the amount of nutrients uh, high enough to produce high yields. And some other ecosystem services apart from yield, but also with high externalities, so with high negative effects on the environment. And where we wanted to end up was in a diversified system where we, by mobilizing many more elements um, in the, in the uh, production system, uh, by considering the soil as not just as a substrate, but as something to be, um, to be uh, managed by itself, to keep the quality of the soil high, um, to have uh, maybe animals included in the system, in addition to plants, uh, and so on. Think out of this very simplistic specialized box. Hopefully then generating so much um, ecosystem services, uh, much larger than here, just in this scheme, uh, that uh, we can do with less inputs because the system provides, replaces in fact some of the external inputs by having more internal cycling, have much less externalities as a result and maintain an acceptable level of yield and possibly even stay at the same level of yield in the long run. And that is what, uh, what we then called ecological intensification at the production system level. But in order to do so, you, you need supportive uh, value chains. So uh, the organization of Orteco was then, well, this top part you've seen already, innovation system we had, uh, we, we were interested in, well, if we now look around Chile, because this was only possible to do in, in Chile because we had limited amount of money. One PhD student, Maria Contese from Chile, and she looked at how are uh, successful um, initiatives of farmers, of consumers around low or no pesticide vegetables. What, what are the, the, the people that really make the change? What are the champions? or the change agents in, in innovation science terms. What are these change agents and how do they operate uh, facilitating ecologically intensive production and, and value chains? Sorry. That's the end. Yeah. Somebody wanted to ask something. Claudia, what oh, was it? No, 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 I just said consumers. I thought I was answering the question. Who are the agents of the change? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Maria is, is in the process of finishing her PhD, so she'll, she'll be able to tell you more. But I think it's, it's very much also, uh, no. Uh, I, I, I can see Carlos uh, uh, now in his new job as boss of Ceres, starting to act as change agent, bringing together people, um, pushing for, such kind of um, transition uh, to more agroecological systems, right? So it's not only the consumers, it can also be people from universities, from experimental stations. Farmers, we've, I have met in Chile amazing farmers who are bringing together other farmers, uh, organizing uh, street markets uh, and so on. So, so those people from a network perspective where many links come together, you could say. Yeah, and consumers could certainly be the pool change agent and consumer organizations maybe even more so than individual consumers. And then the... Maybe the, 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 the ah, yeah. no, sorry, I, yeah. 
it's uh, Maria's work, but for me at least was something, oh really, yeah, you're right. When she present us uh, her PhD and what she was thinking about, for example, we could also think, I don't know anything about this, but just uh, sharing with you what she uh, told us. <laughs> um, for example, you could also think about change agents not related to human beings. For example, a, cha a non-human change agent. So you could maybe think uh, about a, a pest that appear and make all the system, all the farmers, all the consumers be aware of that and, and change the system. But the cause or the agent that generate the change was a non-human or could be a catastrophe or, I mean, you can, you can think about uh, other agents and non not only human. Just to share with you what I received for this uh, colleague Maria, and that was, oh yeah, really, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this, this particular uh, non-human change agent she, she looked at, and which brought about many changes in relations between humans and organizations, was uh, Chinche, uh, this, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Bagrada Hilaris, uh, Chinche. So a very important pest. People were very afraid of it. Uh, pesticides didn't work anymore. And so they had to ch uh, think of uh, new ways of, of controlling, but also new ways of checking or new ways of training. So many different things came together. All stimulated by this change agent uh, insect. Um, and then the, the production system level, so ecologically intensive uh, vegetable production, and, and uh, Mariana uh, is taking that on board as part of her PhD. And we had two PhD students, um, one with a focus on Uruguay and uh, the other with a focus on Chile, um, uh, investigating horizontal and ver vertical marketing arrangements to support ecological intensity. Horizontal meaning uh, between farmers and vertical meaning between farmers and well consumers but in between these uh, farmers and consumers could also be uh, that there are government organizations that where the government has said well we uh, we want our hospitals or our military uh, organizations to buy from agroecological farmers or at least 20% of the amount of food uh, bought for hospitals or for schools should come from. So these kind of arrangements uh, are very important uh, to also understand and, and see uh, in their effects. Uh, it's not only the detailed knowledge that is uh, useful there, but already the exchange between uh, the countries. So just to spread the idea without still uh, knowing if it is super efficient or not, generates this niche going up, more people uh, trying it out. And I think this is the way that uh, humanity has evolved, trying, failing, trying again, failing again, and so on. Okay, and finally, and, and this is what we will hear about, uh, uh, Daniel uh, looking at food system transformability. So how, how, uh, food systems can uh, contribute to changing the dominant food system. So in Orteco, uh, as scientists, we make the choice, the decision to support ecologically intensive food systems. So we only picked a section. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in many other cases, uh, scientists also decide uh, maybe without actually deciding. They may decide to investigate uh, molecular technology for, um, for changing crops to be more resistant to Roundup. And that's not a conscious decision for one system or the other, but in fact, you, you are making a decision for a particular type uh, of actors in food systems. So I think that that should be much more clear 
uh, that scientists say, well, this is the choice we make. So, but in doing so, we were asking ourselves, well, what kind of food systems are around, vegetable food systems in Uruguay and Chile? And which of those food systems are useful for our mission, for our choice? And what makes these systems useful in terms of production value chain and innovation subsystems? So these are all, in fact, knowledge questions, scientific questions uh, that, uh, that you need to solve before uh, actually uh, uh, going into more details. And on the question, which food systems are around? So this is, I think, uh, the, was it you, Claudia, who asked the question, uh, so is this not far too complex? Well, yeah, so we came to Chile, we had no idea of the diversity of, uh, of food systems, huh? most of us. Uh, so how do you then scientifically investigate which are the food systems that, that uh, make sense? And uh, Daniel, uh, originally from, from Colombia, he worked uh, with uh, Carlos's team, um, with uh, all the others in, in Chile, um, and one of his papers uh, is going to be discussed in a, in a minute. Uh, I can say that, meanwhile, the project is over, uh, and um, Daniel now works as a fellow of the Daniel Carrasso Foundation, which is really a very prestigious foundation between uh, Spain and France um, uh, on agroecology in all its dimensions from uh, the citizens, the consumers to uh, production systems. And he works on public procurement. So that is the government buying food um, uh, for hospitals or for schools and how that, those kind of schemes can affect agroecology. And that's in fact what he, in another paper, also studied for Uruguay. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, continued presence, great. Thanks a lot. I like the Thanks. discussion. Thanks, Thanks a lot Carlos. for your contribution to this course. This is the first experience uh, doing this kind of uh, course. So hopefully, next year we can do something similar i think this is really i think a postgraduate program uh, have not this kind of course i think it's a very important topic so thanks a lot again for your contribution and see you next week uh, mariana um and just one just to say a, a short message i would say in spanish Terminando esta clase, voy a enviarles el, el listado de los artículos. Ya eh, me faltaba solamente definir un par de artículos, por eso me demoré un, un par de días más. Eh, así que el orden de asignación va a ser en el orden que ustedes nos escriban. Ya eh, si se demoran un minuto más que otro por el mismo artículo, van a tener que yo les voy a avisar y van a tener que elegir otro. Ya así para que estén atentos. Bueno, ok. Ah, y bueno, y también voy a enviarle el material de la presentación de, de Juan Luis, que fue antes de ayer, ¿verdad? Y algunos artículos que él me envió. Bueno, Yo muchas tengo... gracias a todos por su participación. Thanks a lot, Walter, again. Have a nice day. Afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. See you.